My friends, hi patrons, and now the wider daily Bible study community. This is the bonus episodes that I'm slotting in between seasons. This is one I recorded back on the 27th of May, 2023. So it's been on Patreon for about a year, but I'm now letting it loose, so to speak, to sit as a bonus episodes while I do my preparations between the season we've just spent together in the book of Numbers and before we kick off in John. It gives me a bit of preparation time. Sometimes when I attend my philosophy group meeting, it can be just a round table discussion where nobody particularly wants to lead in an item. Other times it is more of a debate where someone is given about 20 or 30 minutes to pair a talk on the subject that week and then people respond with the round table instruction to it. On this occasion it was just a round table discussion and this is my preparation notes in preparing to take part in that discussion. Also it's worth noting that although a particular philosopher is discussed each week we only tend to approach it through the lens of one particular work each time. Otherwise, we would have used up all the philosophers many years ago. So this time, the philosopher we're considering is Aristotle, but particularly his work, politics. I do hope you find it helpful. Okay, friends, welcome to this bonus episode. Today I'm looking and just letting you know some of my thoughts, my musings, uh, my preparation that I made for a philosophy group meeting I attended recently where we, we discussed the thinking of Aristotle and particularly his foundational work called Politics. I hope you find them helpful, particularly if you're maybe a student who's studying philosophy on an introductory level, but I would say that I'm not a philosopher. I'm a simple Christian Bible teacher with a bit of theological training in the background, but I do hope you find it helpful. I certainly do in my preparation for these evenings that I attend. By way of introduction, I'd just like to ask a question, which is vital when understanding particularly Aristotle and what he said in this book, Politics, and that is what makes a good society. In this work, Aristotle asked that question And he used terms that we're still using today, terms like oligarchies, democracy, monarchies. This is a highly influential work. Through it, Aristotle tried to establish a way of preserving a society through what were, in those days, very dangerous times. Thinking about how it should be governed and who should be allowed to live in it. People like Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Aquinas, to name but a few, have all asked the same questions over the years. And Aristotle's conclusions range across issues about the role of wealth, about the law, about how men, women and slaves should interact with each other and how they should be treated, as well as discussing things like education and leisure. They are very far-reaching thoughts indeed, influential, and at many times may appear unpalatable to a Christian worldview, but also at many times embraced by people who believe by way of right as a sort of cultural elite should hold positions where they rule or reign. So in the work uh, Politics, Aristotle tries to establish the fact of why, first of all, human beings live together and if they do do, which they seem they want to do, how they should do it. And the first things you'd have to say when trying to approach this is to understand Aristotle's opening statement in the fact that he says that he believes that all humans are naturally political animals and by that he means that if as human beings we're going to flourish, if we're going to prosper, we need to actualize our naturally and distinctive human facility, particularly those unique things to, to human beings, intellectual and moral faculties, that these are in effect just human virtues have to be actualized within a social context, within relationship with other people. They cannot be brought to reality outside of that. He believed we were naturally designed to live together in communities, and for him that meant the city-state. That is the context in which he wrote, and he which he believed that people can flourish. 
Now probably with Socrates and Aristotle lie the first elaboration of the distinction between what was seen as natural and cultural. However, confusingly, it seems to me that at the same time he said there isn't a divide between natural things that one rises out of the other. We are naturally designed, he said, to live together, which he called cultures. So it's impossible to approach Aristotle's thinking with first of all having a look at what he called the city-state. Think about its origins and, and its purpose. Well, it had two natural origins and that was modelled, he believed, or grew out of the natural pairs of human associations, the pair between female and male, initially for the purposes of procreation, having children, and the others was that between master and slaves, for the purpose of mutual preservation. Therefore, the political state is natural in his mind and the natural ends of these two earlier natural associations. And that is why he believed that the natural organism, if you like, for which human beings should live together and thrive in should be what was called at that time the city-state. So what I'm going to do now is just take a little bit of time and give you a very potted biography of Aristotle and his main teaching and thinking before actually looking at it and analysing it and responding to it from a Christian perspective. In terms of his life, very little is known about his life. We do know he's born in the city of Stagiria in northern Greece, round about 384 BC. His father was called Nomachus, and he died when Aristotle was a child, so he was actually brought up by a guardian. At round about 17 or 18 years of age, he joined Plato's Academy in Athens, the famous school of philosophy, and he remained there until approximately the age of 37. Shortly after Plato died, or in fact killed himself, Aristotle left Athens and at the request of someone called Philip II of Macedon, he went there and tutored his son. Interestingly, his son would be later known as Alexander the Great. It was while there he established a library in the Lyceum, which helped him to produce many of his hundreds of books. Though Aristotle apparently wrote huge, numerous, very lengthy and elegant treaties and dialogues which were intended for publication, it is believed only about a third of his original input has survived to this day, and many that were intended for publication has been lost. Through his writing, Aristotle provided a complex interweaving of the various philosophies that existed prior to him and up to the time that he was teaching and thinking about these things. Many would say that it is from his teaching that we see the West incorporate huge reams of it into their intellectual thought through patterns as well as addressing how to address problems and methods of inquiry. So as a result, his philosophy has exerted a unique influence on almost every form of knowledge in the West, particularly the thinking of some very early Christian scholars, particularly Thomas Aquinas, and it continues to be the subject of contemporary and religious philosophical influence and discussion. He wrote incredibly widely. He wrote in the area of natural philosophy, physics. Indeed, his physics rose to what are famously known as Aristotle's five elements, earth, water, air and fire. He also, in terms of physics, he created an early law of motion where he described two different kinds of motion, the violent or a natural motion and natural motion. These, of course, are now seen as incorrect by modern physics. He then came up with his causes, his famous four causes. Aristotle used an analogy with woodwork of how a thing can take its form from one or more of four causes. And he used as an example the case of a table. The wood used in the table was its material cause, its design was its formal cause, and the tools and the techniques that the object could be used for was what he called as its efficient clause. And then there was finally its decorative or its practical purpose, which he called the final cause. He also wrote and studied lenses and optics. He describes experiments using an early sort of camera obscura in his book called Problems, book 15, where he created a sort of apparatus with a small chamber that let light in. And with it he saw that whatever shape he made the hole, the sun's image always remained circular when projected onto the background. He also noted that increasing the difference between the aperture and the image surface actually magnified the image projected there. 
He also wrote heavily on things he called chance and spontaneity. According to Aristotle, spontaneity and chance are causes of some things, distinguishable from other types of causes for simple necessity or utility. Chance he saw as an incidental cause and it lay in the realm of what he called accidental things which rise out of spontaneous unplanned actions. There is also, he talked about a specific kind of chance which Aristotle named luck, a term we still use today. But he said that only applied to people's moral choices. For his day, he was also very interested and educated in astronomy. He actually refuted Democritus's claim that the Milky Way was made up of only the stars that are shaded by the Earth from the sun's rays, pointing out correctly, if the size of the sun is greater than the Earth, and the distance of the stars from the Earth is many times greater than the sun, then the sun shines on all the stars, and the Earth effectively screens none of them, or if, if so, very few of them. He also wrote extensively on what we would call today geology and the natural sciences. He was one of the first people to record any geological observations. He noted that geological change was in fact happening, but it was too slow to be observed in one person's lifetime. Aristotle also made observations about what has been, become known as the hydrochloric cycle and an early form of meteorology. He also made some of the earliest observations about what happens when seawater is heated and fresh water evaporates and that the oceans are then seen to be replenishing the cycle of water on the earth through rainfall and river runoff. He also had an interest in biology and made many pioneering zoological observations. Aristotle described in detail the reproductive process of the octopus. He was the first person to study biology systematically. And biology indeed forms a very large part of his writing. He spent two years of specifically observing and describing the zoology of the island of Lesbos and the surrounding seas. His data was presented in a scroll called The History of Animals. Generations of animals, movements of animals, parts of animals, all assembled together in different volumes from his own observations. He also evoked to, took notes extensively from people with specialised knowledge, such as beekeepers and fishermen. Aristotle reported at length on the sea life that was visible from observation. He catalogued the catches of fishermen. He describes catfish, electric ray, and what he calls frogfish in detail, as well as some cellopods and what we would today identify as octopuses. He was one of the first to give an accurate description of the four-chambered, four-stomach anatomy of ruminants. He noted animal structure was matched to function. He noted that birds, like herons, which live in marshes with soft muds, have flat feet and catch small creatures by long neck and long legs and sharp spear-like beaks, whereas also noting that ducks and other similar birds had short legs and webbed feet, enabling them to float and navigate on water. He also wrote on psychology. He had a theory of the soul, believing that the soul consists of three parts, the psyche, the vegetative soul and the sensitive soul and the rational soul. For Aristotle, the soul is the form of a living being, in contrast to early philosophers who had said otherwise. But like many others, he placed the soul in the heart, in the breast, rather than in the brain. Aristotle famously criticised and diverged from Plato's theory of the soul and developed his own view of it in response to Plato. He was also one of the first people to study what we would today call, I suppose, cognitive or maybe even neuroscience and how memory is he defined as the ability to hold on to a perceived experience in the mind and he distinguished between the internal and the external appearance of events that happened in the past. In other words, he actually believed that memory was a sort of picture, a ghost. He actually called it a phantasm that can then be recovered. Aristotle used the term memory for the actual retaining of experience in the form of an impression that can develop a sensation which can either reproduce anxiety again by refocusing on a particular time past, but he did identify that memory sat in the past and that although it could predict the future in terms of informing it, but not from any sensation presented. But he did write about how the retrieval of memories, the retrieval of impressions, can be perfectly and suddenly called to action. 
and he believed that there must have been some sort of traditional channel needed within our psyche to locate past experiences, both from the point of view of ruminating on them and to help with present experiences. He also wrote extensively on dreams. He believed that while a person is asleep, critical activities which include thinking, sensing, recalling and remembering do not function as they do during wakefulness. Since a person cannot sense during sleep that they ha- or can have any desire, which is the result of the sensation. One component of Aristotle's theory of dream disagrees with the previously held beliefs of that time. He claimed that dreams could not, in fact, foretell the future and were not sent by a divine being. Aristotle reasoned, naturalistically, that the instances in which dreams resemble future events are simply, he believed, a coincidence. He also wrote extensively on what we today call practical philosophy on areas such as ethics, politics, economics and rhetoric. In terms of ethics, Aristotle considered ethics to be practical rather than a theoretical study and he wrote several essays, treaties, etc. on ethics, some of which are most noted to this day. He was an early writer about the issue of what are called economics today. He has made substantial contribution to economic thought that holds to this day, and certainly did into the Middle Ages. Aristotle believed that through communal arrangements, things that were beneficial to society could be made, and that although private property could be often blamed for social strife, such things were in fact a natural result of human nature. And in his most famous book, Politics, which is the one we were discussing, and I primarily prepared to discuss, Aristotle offers one of the earliest counts of the origins of money. He had a very low opinion of retail or people who needed to work for a living, believing that contrary to using money to procure things one needs in managing a household, like retail trade or in anything that seemed to make profit, for him it seems good that money should be a means to an end rather than the end itself. He believed that retail trade was in a way unnatural, Similarly, Aristotle considered making a profit through interest, usury unnatural, something also later adopted by not just the Jewish community, but the Christian church later. And to to make gains out of money for money's sake in and of itself was not a good thing. He wrote on poetry and rhetoric. Aristotle's view of rhetoric proposes that a speaker should use three kinds of appeal to persuade his audience. Firstly, ethos, an appeal to the speaker's character, pathos, an appeal to the audience's emotion, and logos, an appeal to logical reasoning. He also put that into dramatic form, and he used writings on a very famous tragedy of the time called Oedipus Tyrannus by Sophocles as an example of how the perfect tragedy should be structured, with generally what would be identified as a good protagonist, who starts the play wealthy and prosperous, but loses everything through some fault. While it's believed that Aristotle's book Poetics, which deals with this issue, it's believed to have originally comprised of two books, one that dealt with comedy and one with tragedy, it seems that only the volume that focused on tragedy has survived. And now we come finally to his his work, Politics, in which he addressed the city and the city-state in this work. And as I said, he considered the city to be the natural community in which people lived. Moreover, he considered the city to be of extreme importance in the role of the family, which in turn is important for the individual. He famously stated that, quote, at the beginning of his book, man is by nature a political animal and argue that humanity's defining factor, among others, that sets it apart from the animal kingdom, is its rationality. Aristotle conceived us politics as being like an organism rather than a machine or a structure, and a collection of parts, none of which can exist without the other. Aristotle's conception of the city-state was organic, and he was one of the very first to conceive of community of people in this way. The modern understanding of a political community or as a modern state, however, is quite different from Aristotle's understanding in his day. Although he was aware of the existence of potentially larger empires and natural communities and other communities which formed a sort of quasi-political community of partnership, he believed that the aim of the city and the natural city-state was not just to dispense justice or provide economic stability, but rather should exist to allow 
some of the citizens give them the possibility of living what was called the good life and to perform what he called beautiful acts. The political partnership may be regarded, therefore, as being for the sake of noble actions, not just for the sake of living together as a community. This is distinguished from modern approaches, which begin with this idea of the social contract into which individuals live in a city-state because of fear, otherwise of it descending into violent or even death. As Plato's disciple initially, Aristotle was rather critical of what we would today call democracy. And following the outline of certain ideas from Plato's statesman, he developed his own theory of integrating various forms of power into what he called the mixed state. To illustrate this, Aristotle proposed a kind of mathematical model of voting, where the democratic principle of one voter, one vote, was combined with this sort of merit waiting voting system where some were given a higher level of votes and he actually scribed this into written form in the form of mathematical formulas so that's who he was and that's his thinking but let's now think about aristotle's influence on christian thinking and theology There's no doubt he left an indelible mark on the history of Western thought. Whilst Aristotle's influence is most commonly associated with secular philosophy, his ideas also influenced greatly Christian thinking, particularly in the Middle Ages. There are five areas where I think there was a particular overlap between his thinking and where it influenced particularly Christian thinking. The first was on the compatibility of reason and faith. One of the central aspects of Aristotle's philosophy is his emphasis on reason and rational inquiry. He believed that human intellect, when properly cultivated, can lead to the discovery of what he called truth and understanding. And that notion aligns to some extent with the Christian belief in the capacity of human reason to comprehend and understand the natural world and to engage in theological discussions about it. Aristotle's emphasis on the importance of rationality provided some early Christian thinkers with a framework to reconcile their faith with reason, and later even then with the emerging of science enabled them to engage a deeper exploration of theological concepts through intellectual inquiry. A term used to this day in theological circles is the term the cosmological argument for God. An Aristotle concept of the unmoved mover resonated very strongly with our early Christian theologians. The cosmological argument, which seeks to prove the existence of God based on order observed in the natural world, actually finds its roots in Aristotle's philosophy. Christian thinkers, particularly Thomas Aquinas, they incorporated Aristotle's metaphysical concepts into their theological arguments, using reason, using observation of the natural world to support the belief in a transcendent creator. Also his writing on ethics and virtues and morality. Now we need to note that Aristotle's ethical theory centred around the cultivation of what were called virtues, which had a very significant impact on Christian moral thought. The concept of virtues or ethics emphasised the development of character traits that he said led to moral excellence and the pursuit of the highest good. It, but it was very much for him defined by what was considered important in his day. So things like military prowess were very high in the figuring. Early Christian thinkers like Augustine and Aquinas, well they kind of adopted Aristotle's framework to align that perspective with Christian moral teachings. They saw virtues, yes, but they widened out and added the essential component of spiritual growth and emphasised the importance of cultivating virtues, additional virtues, biblical virtues such as prudence, justice, temperance, in other words, the opposite of hot-headedness, and perseverance and fortitude in the Christian life. Aristotle was also an earlier proponent of the design argument for the universe and it was this understanding of what is called teleology, the study of the purpose and the final cause, that influenced Christian thinkers to this day into having an understanding of the divine providence of God and the design argument for the existence of God. Aristotle, you see, was the first that argued that everything in nature had a specific purpose and was directed towards a specific end. Christian theologians 
built upon this idea to an extent, but they posited that the intricate order and the purpose observed in the natural world are actually evidence of a divine designer rather than just a divine design. The design argument that we hear to this day is rooted in Aristotle's teleology and has become and remained an important theological argument supporting the belief in an intelligent creator. And then finally, his influence heavily overlapped and influenced Christian scholars during the Middle Ages. Aristotle's works, you see, were rediscovered then and they had a profound impact on the idea of the development of a scholastic approach to understanding the scriptures, the setting up of schools, colleges, universities, monasteries, where the scriptures would be studied at length. And figures such as Thomas Aquinas, he drew heavily upon Aristotle's philosophy and incorporated aspects of it into his theological view of the world. You see, Aristotle's work provided a framework for a scholastic approach to organising knowledge, developing logical arguments, and that was used and then adapted to enable people to engage in both theological and philosophical discussions. By embracing and integrating Aristotle's concept into their intellectual framework, particularly medieval Christian thinkers found a means to harmonise faith and region, to explore the ever-widening natural theology of the world, that was rising up before him and to communicate Christ's teaching into that world with a moral framework as well as giving people the language to engage in not just theological debates but debates with people who were experts in natural philosophy the things that they would see in the world and I have to say Aristotle's lasting influence continues to inspire Christian scholars to this day so there has been a really profound and enduring impact of his philosophical legacy on Christian thought to this day for good and, I would say, sometimes for ill. So thinking about where we come up against challenges in Aristotle's thinking when compared to Christian theology, and there are many. You see, the study of Aristotle's philosophy presents unique challenges when compared to the teachings of Christ, of the Bible, Old and New Testament, and Christian theology. While both belief systems would on the surface seek to uncover truth and meaning, their different approaches lead at least to tension and to some very real differences and divergences. So I'm going to close the second half of the talk by looking some of, at some of the key problems encountered when the teaching and thinking of Aristotle is set alongside Christian theology. And I want to highlight some of those divergences in the perspectives and some of the complexes that arise out of them. There is first the epistemological differences. I know that's a big word that just means the theory of knowledge, especially within regard to methods to establish validity and scope and to recognise the difference between what you believe and what is just opinion. One of the primary challenges when studying Aristotle in comparison to Christian theology lies in these different foundations. Aristotle's philosophy emphasises, above all, the role of reason and empirical observation in the understanding of the world, whereas in Christian theology it places significant emphasis on the faith as the source of knowledge and revelation, faith in God. Integrating these contrasting approaches can be very challenging. In fact, we may meet struggle or may even find it impossible to reconcile the two. Just on the surface, you can see straight away the demand for a strict view of rational inquiry. How does that sit alongside embracing a faith as a fundamental aspect of Christian belief? Paul, writing to Corinthians, dealt with his very problems of this perspective when he pointed out that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perceiving but who have not been saved because it is the power of God. So Paul, you see, highlights the contrast between what is the perceived wisdom of man and the wisdom of God and how the wisdom of God can seem foolish to the world. And it is this wisdom of the world that ultimately is the understanding that Aristotle, well, at least prioritised, in fact, probably thought was wholly it. There's a huge difference on the nature of how Greek philosophers and how Christians today would view the nature of God himself. Aristotle's concept of the unmoved mover presents before us a sort of detached and an impersonal deity, characterised almost by pure intellect, devoid of any personal attributes, certainly not someone who is able to love or be loved, no sense of compassion, no sense of divine intervention, 
But in contrast, Christian theology views God as a personal being, someone who actively engages with his creation, who expresses love, grace, and is involved in human affairs. So bringing these two opposite conceptions together, well, one might say it's impossible and at best it's demanding. Yet within the Bible, with the very simple statement, God is love, as seen in 1 John and in other places, it cuts through all of that and just captures the essence of the Christian belief of God's nature as one being of love and personal engagement, which is totally different from Aristotle's conception of just this God as an impersonal, unmoved mover. Aristotle's belief in the purpose of any final cause and divine providence proves challenges as well when we lay it beside an orthodox christian understanding of the fact that god is involved and can use natural means to bring about his ends aristotle's framework suggests that everything in nature has a specific purpose and therefore directed towards in a sense of a single end christian theology on the other hand attributes divine providence to god allowing it all to exist within his overarching plan for creation. Navigating the tension between these two concepts can be complex because the more we explore Aristotle's natural teleology as a cause and lay it alongside the idea of God as being a God who's in sovereign and in control and can offer guidance by turning to him, we hit a brick wall because Aristotle's perspective leaves no possibility for the idea of divine providence and a purposeful plan for each or any individual's life. Yet the Bible teaches otherwise and it is expressed for us beautifully in many places. One example is the prophet Jeremiah which in 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have of you, declares the Lord. So this is perceived to be God speaking, telling us his plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. There is also a completely different perspective on ethics and a moral worldview. Aristotle's idea of what we would today call ethics or moral virtues lie on this phrase, virtues. But that lays solely within the remit of the cultivation of moral character and intellectual character and presents a huge challenge in relation to the Christian's emphasis on obedience to divine commandments and on the redemptive work of Christ. While Aristotle focuses on the development of virtues through things like rational inquiry and moral formation and learning skills that are appropriate and relevant for that society at that time. Very differently, Christian theology highlights the role of divine revelation, grace, and the fact that there is a transforming power available to believers through faith. Aligning these perspectives is very problematic, as how can you grasp a sort of moral plumb line when approaching it from an Aristotelian point of view? Whereas within the Christian worldview, the role of possible divine intervention is not only available, but it is absolutely available and involved in the living out of an ethical life. Jesus' commandment to love God and one's neighbours highlights the centrality of love and compassion in Christian ethics and goes way, way beyond anything that Aristotle can focus on. His emphasis is just basically on the development of virtues through rational inquiry that can serve the current city-state. Jesus, quoting Luke in chapter ten twenty seven, says, and this is Jesus answering, when asked what is the greatest commandment, he said, you shall simply love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind as near your neighbour as yourself. Such a wider, deeper perspective than just the practical, empirical view of virtue as contained within Aristotle's view of the city-state. And then there's a very different view on what's called eschatology. In other words, that whole Christian theology area concerned with death, judgment and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind as a whole and the afterlife. Christian theology encompasses a hugely wide and rich understanding of the end times. There is a belief in the afterlife, including a concept of heaven and hell and eternal salvation. In contrast, Aristotle's philosophy lacks any framework for addressing any of these aspects. Teaching Aristotle alongside Christian theology 
requires almost impossible navigation through these disparities. We can't find common ground because the further we explore, the further the implications of our understanding of the ultimate destiny of humanity and the nature of eternal existence lying within God creates, in my mind, an overcomable barrier for common ground with with Aristotle's philosophy. Jesus himself summed this up for us in one sentence, talking about God's plan and purpose for us now and into the future was that he said that for simply for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This well-known verse speaks very clearly of the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ which is a total different perspective on any afterlife compared to Aristotle's thinking. So in conclusion, I have to say that the teaching of Aristotle in comparison or in in terms of its utility to a Christian faith of belief presents us with a very large range of challenges and difficulties. Disparities between what is belief and what is opinion will, will arrive. These two worldviews have very different conceptions of who or what God actually is. Tensions regarding divine providence, ethics, variations in our future history in terms of our souls or of humanity, they all contribute to massive complexities and if you were trying to bring these two things together. Having said that, despite these challenges, the exploration of Aristotle's philosophy alongside Christian thinking can offer a valuable opportunity to apply critical thinking, which enables us to have intellectual engagement with people who aren't Christians. Development may be perhaps of more nuanced understanding of different philosophical and theological traditions. By grappling with these tensions, we can gain a deeper application for the complexities of human thought and the diverse perspectives that contribute to our understanding of what is truth and meaning. But there are some huge blocks along that road. His views on women are going to be very problematic for many, for most I would assume, as were many people who wrote and existed that time. Aristotle's analysis of procreation describes an active masculine element that brings life to an inert passive female element. Now that may be attractive to some on the margins of of Christian thinking, but Aristotle grounded this in the biological difference as being the result of the fact that the female body is well suited for reproduction. But because of that, he also came to form the idea that it was changes in body temperatures which made the raising of the body temperatures which made the woman able to conceive, which later became taught by some to mean that it was impossible for a raped woman to become pregnant unless they were complicit in their attack, which of course is very problematic by today's thinking. Also his views on women being incapable of participating in political life. On that ground, Not only many Christians, but many proponents of feminist thinking would rightly accuse Aristotle of misogyny and sexism by today's standards. However, in his defence it should be noted that Aristotle gave equal weight to women's happiness as he did men when he commented in his his writing called Rhetoric of how things that should lead to happiness, they should in some way be measured and be able to be measured, and that measurement should take into account both men and women. Biblical teaching will always emphasise things such as faith, love and the divine providence of God alongside the promise of an eternal life, which directly challenge the core aspects of all of Aristotle's philosophical framework. While we can, as Christian believers, appreciate his contribution to human understanding, as Christians we must recognise that that his teaching at that time was almost unparalleled in its width and depth we cannot fail to recognise the unparalleled, unequal depth and transformative power of the teaching of Christ and its application through Christian living today and in the world and for 2,000 years. Christianity offers for us a profound understanding of the nature of God and our relationship with him, which Aristotle could never do or didn't even try to do. You see, in Scripture, we discover not just a designer, but a loving creator who desires a personal connection with his creation and with each and every one of us within it. 
and the teaching of Christ reveal the path to salvation, eternal life, and the restoration of a broken relationship with God through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, through which we can find forgiveness and reconciliation and a promise of that future filled with hope. In contrast, Aristotle's philosophy, while influential in many areas, falls short in its understanding of the divine and the ultimate purpose of human existence. And that's a pretty big thing to fall short of. His emphasis on reason or logic alone can lead to a life that's defined by purely intellectual pursuit, neglecting those who aren't, aren't created with those abilities and neglecting those who recognise that there is a profound spiritual dimension to our lives. Aristotle's philosophy lacks any genuine transformative power and any personal relationship, not only you would say with anyone outside your own political class, but certainly other human beings who have the same valued and worldview, but also most importantly, denying a relationship, a personal relationship with God through Christ, the very thing that Christianity offers. You see, a Christian understanding can empower our lives to live a life of love, purpose, alongside this moral excellence, but a moral excellence much more widely defined than just Aristotle's narrow definition of virtues. It teaches us to, in fact, extend grace and forgiveness to others and to seek justice for the oppressed and to cultivate virtues that go way beyond the virtues that Aristotle taught, virtues that he taught only reflected the area in which he lived. Christian virtues reflect something eternal because they reflect the character of Christ. The teaching of Jesus invites us into a deep personal relationship with God, transforming our hearts and guiding us towards a life of meaning and significance. Aristotle, on the other hand, his teaching at best can lead to an emphasis on a degree of personal fulfilment and yet granted self-interest, but it is detached from a higher moral framework and could only ever apply to an elite section of society as he saw it. While Aristotle recognised the importance of developing virtues, his definition of virtue lacks any genuine transformative power the very same power that Christ's teaching and the divine guidance is made available to us in the words of Christ, in the teachings of the Bible and in Christian theology and teaching ever since. So as we reflect on the power and the relevance of a life surrendered and transformed by Christ alongside what philosophy, particularly Aristotle's philosophy, has to offer, well, my view would be let us instead hold on to and allow ourselves to be inspired by holding a positive view of the Christian faith. Let us recognise that through it we have profound truths to offer way over and above anything that Greek philosophy could offer because the transformative impact can be on our lives and on the lives of others around us. Never forgetting that also with instilled with us is an eternal hope. In Christ we can find a solid foundation, a moral compass and a personal collection with God that surpasses any human philosophy. Thereby, together, let it be a testament to the power of redeemed life that we can live a life of love and grace and purpose. And let us recognise that by embracing the teaching of Christ rather than teaching of any worldly philosophy by allowing the life words teaching and ministry of Christ to shape our thoughts our actions and our relationships through the transformative power of the gospel that way we can make a truly lasting impact to the world effectively as the bible puts it shining the light of God and God's truth into every corner so I'd just clo like to close by saying that I trust that the strength and wisdom and love found in Christ himself, that it continues to light a fire within all of us, inspiring you and I to live lives that bring honour to God and blessing to others, so that as we go forth, we can hold fast to the truths of our faith, knowing that through Jesus Christ we have the power not only to have our own lives redeemed and changed, but to change lives and transform other people's lives, transform communities, and in effect bring hope to a world in need. So thank you for listening. And I trust that God's abundance blessings, the very things that we've talked about, the virtues of God that we can receive, that we can embrace them and embrace the richness of the Christian life and share its life-giving message with anyone you would happen to encounter.
along the way.